Hey, thanks for tuning in today. We've got a great show for you with Scott Bernstein, and we're going to be talking about Hoffa, the Detroit mob, the Winter Hill Gang of Boston, and uh, some other factions of La Cosa Nostra. So stay tuned in. We're going to have a lot for you today. And uh, this is the part one of the two-part series. Thank you for tuning in. Scott, thanks for tuning in today. Uh, come oh, on to the show. Great, with us. I love what you guys do. Thank you so <laughs> much. And we love what you do. And I love too. the fact that I've gotten to meet, you know, I love being able to find and meet people that I've either read about or researched or written about, you know, for the last uh, however many years and then finally get to make them, uh, you know, multi dimensional. They're not just a name <laughs> on a piece of paper. Yeah, no, it's good. I remember how long ago did we do the radio show, Scott? I did your radio, Scott. Oh, about a, I think about a year ago. Wow, was that long ago, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that was then, good. That you know, was I met, show. I, I, before I was even uh, into this world, I was reading, uh, you know, uh, when I was in law school, I was reading about, you know, Bobby and uh, Joey's case. And that's one of the things yeah. that really sparked me um, into wanting to, you know, uh, write about it and chronicle it. And I was, it's, uh, I was working in the attorney general's office in, in Chicago. Oh, uh, in that's what it was. Out there. Yeah. You know, it's amazing because, you know, we talked before, they split the indictment with Philly and Boston. And yeah. They put Mayan under the Luisi faction in Boston and Joey under the Molino faction in Philly to come after both of us as bosses. And Joey ended up uh, beating the drug case. He yeah, beat, beat the drug case, beat the murders. Yeah. He still had to do 12 yeah. years, but. Yeah. Well, he did. He got fourteen. I ended up getting twenty. I got more than yeah. him. <laughs> and he was in from ninety nine to eleven. Yeah, I got out in uh, thirteen. Yeah, thirteen. I did more than. And then, Ra and then Ralph, who testified against him, uh, ended up doing more time than he did too. <laughs> well, you know, I did talk to the prosecutors, and they said he did a terrible job on the trial. Oh, yeah, 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 you know, he full disclosure, I also worked on. Uh, Ralph's book proposal, and then I ended up leaving the project uh, before it, it uh, was was written because I just could not uh, co-sign a lot of the stuff that he was saying in there, and uh, I was just like, I can't as a as a reporter, I can't put my name to this. This yeah. whole like, you know, he's saying that I lied on the stand, and I really was made back in 1966. Yeah. By Carlo Gambino and a you know a ceremony that, in Manhattan. That was the funniest. I'm not writing that. I'm like, you no, can, no. You can put that. I'm not. I'm not yeah. going to write. It. He was on Valuetainment, and I watched him on there with Patrick, and he was telling Patrick how Carlo Gambino and Al Bruno cut his hand. Yeah. Says you're yeah. in. You're with us. That would never happen in a million years. No. And I and let me tell you that I like Ralph. I I, I do actually. Too. Yeah. I actually had a really cordial, friendly relationship with him in those, uh, and that it was about another six months, just like I with Cadillac Frank. Right. Uh, uh, and both with Cadillac Frank too. I mean, they were really easy to deal with and very congenial and very, you know, both of them legends in their own mind. And, oh, they are. Uh, I would say Frank was probably a, a little bit more reality based in yeah. what was going on, even though Frank had his own issues clearly too. Oh, Frank was um, out there. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Frank was out there. There's no but, doubt about uh, that. Yeah, I, I have nothing personal against Ralph at all. I really like Ralph. I just, I, I told Ralph at the time that you're doing your, you're undermining your own cause by this embellishment and refusing to own certain parts of your past. Yeah. And just, you just like, with, I mean, it's okay to say I made a mistake here. I made a mistake there. Hindsight's twenty twenty. If I had, but you know, he refused to acknowledge that he did anything wrong. Yeah, I don't. You know, and it was, and it's just like you know, it's it's not, uh, you know, things aren't black and white. There's always gray here. Well, the Ralph Natali story. Ralph was trying to say and blame Joey and the kids of Philly for everything, that all right. the Young Turks. 
Um, Ralph got picked up on a violation because Ralph Previty got him on wire. Mm -hmm. Now he's in there, he's getting superseded on another Met charge, which he had gone to prison before for. I'm in Fairton, New Jersey, with his son-in-law's brother. He told me the whole oh, story. Con the, Con the Constantines? Yeah, yeah, I was with the brother, and he told me the whole story. Mm -hmm. Ralph didn't flip because of Joey in Philly. Mm -hmm. Ralph flipped because he was never getting out again. Yeah. That's why yeah. Ralph flipped. And there's another part of the story <laughs> that's never really made it out. There's been little flashes that have come out and if you yeah. read between the lines you can figure it out but i mean i have no problem saying it because it's it's fact and it's clear as day after ralph made his cooperation agreement in the fall of 99 mm -hmm. he was cooperating with the government he had jumped to team usa and at the same time he's working with pete the crumb caprio to try to kill <laughs> the, 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 the Merlino regime. The Merlino yeah. was in jail, so he couldn't be killed. But right. Ralph was trying to get it, so Caprio became boss. He was politicking with some of the guys in New York. They were going to kill a Gamby, Georgie Borghese, and Stevie Mazzone. The whole thing was planned. And that plan was being guided not just by Pete the Crumb, Crap, Pete the Crumb Caprio, yeah. but also by Ralph in prison. They have the phone call. I have the, I have the transfer. Imagine yeah, that. and the Gambino family yeah. was behind that. See, I, I've never yeah. talked about that on the show. I'm glad you brought that up because I never talked yeah. about that. But that I mean, was the plan. He was in Caprio's ear all throughout December, January, February. Caprio eventually flipped, I want to say, in March or April. Yeah. But those three or four months leading up to it, there was all these phone calls between Natalie and Natalie is coaching him and coping him while Natalie is supposedly working for the, or not supposedly, working for the government. Government. And he's still, and he's still, and he's still on him and killing people and all this. Yeah. And they yeah. wonder why yeah. they get into all these jams they get, they get all these with the jams. government yeah. and Whitey Bulger incidents and all these other things that get And then one of the guys, you know, one of, I actually did write about this part. One of the guys that was involved in that conspiracy on the street uh, was a big bookie named uh, Danny, D Am, uh, Danny D. Ambrosio, they called Danny D. And, uh, you know, he wasn't a made guy or anything, but according to the plan, they were going to whack those three guys out. Caprio was going to make D'Ambrosio and then up him to underboss. Wow. wow. Well, they had a and yeah. this, is, this was a guy that Ralph and Joey had gotten really close to in the late 90s. He was making so much money as a bookie. Yeah. But he wasn't a tough guy or anything. He was actually with Ralph when Ralph got taken off the street in uh, the summer of 98. Ralph mm -hmm. was walking out with Danny D from his uh, apartment. They were going to lunch and the feds swooped in. Yeah. But uh, Danny D's dad had to go to, allegedly, had to go to Joe Legambi and pay him, I heard a quarter million dollars uh, to make it so when Danny D came out of prison, they weren't gonna take uh, vengeance. Mm -hmm. And oh, Legambi's actually on a, um, on a wire that the Gambino guy, uh, Nicky Skin Stefanelli, who wired up on him, uh, Gambi's on a wire telling parts of that story to Stefanelli about Danny D's dad coming to see him and begging for his son's life, and you know, yeah, all because of that that uh, harebrained plot, mm -hmm. you know, in in the early two in early two thousand that never got off the ground, but. See, now here's the problem, because I know, because I was a cop in the family, Polly was yeah. a soldier in the family, right. and the inside story, Scott, you know, Ralph came home, Joey made him, and that same night he made him the boss. Right. Ralph never wanted to admit that. He testified to it in court. So it's, a, it's like, Ralph, so yeah. you're either lying, you're either perjuring yourself on the stand, and that's going to tear up your agreement. Right. Or... You're lying here about the fact that you were made in 1966. Yeah, like, yeah. That was the funniest thing I ever... When I saw that on Value Tainment... You know, when I first met Ralph, we used to go down to Cherry Hill. We used to go down to the pub. I meet him at the racetrack. Yeah, he was at the racetrack, the Curry and Eyes room. Yeah, he, see, he was a nice, level-headed guy. Uh, one of my guys up here that did some good things for me, if you want to call it that. Frank Rossi was in prison with him. Told me how well... You know, he carried himself in prison. And that made me go down there with the introduction to actually meet Ralph. And he seemed like a level-headed guy. And I could see why Joey did that. Put Ralph up front. 
yeah. to deal with the New York guys, you know, because Joey was more in the neighborhood, and he probably figured it was a better cushion between New York to have an older guy there. Hey, Ra Ralph, to Ralph's credit, you know, if you're going to break this up into a, a, a pot, you know, he legitimately did, let's say, 50 to 75% of the job to get to the point where you would be a good boss. Yeah. Like, there, he was putting things in place uh, in terms of his ability to politic and his ability to, to you know, co-sign Joey and you know, the fact that he was connected to Bruno, the fact that he was a legitimate, I mean, there's nothing uh, false about the fact that Ralph was a killer mm -hmm. and that Ralph, Ralph was a, a legitimate tough guy. Uh, so that wasn't, that's not BS. Yeah, and so he had a lot of things going for him, and then and then he was a uh, you know he's like that. You guys, you uh, Bobby, you know me. He was, oh uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he could, in another life he could have been a, a football coach. Yeah, you know, he, he would yeah. give these uh, uh, you know pep pep <laughs> pep rally speeches or or uh, inspirational uh, talks, and I would talk to some of these guys that were you know contemporaries of you at the time. And they would say, like, yeah, we'd walk out of that meeting ready to go take on the world. Yeah. Thinking that everything that Ralph was telling us that he was going to go be able to do. Right. And when you really broke it down at the end of the day with who Ralph was, Ralph was a drug dealer. Yeah. Yep. Bottom line. Bottom and that's really all he could do. Yeah, he, he was, was a meth dealer. Yeah. He was he was speaking a great game to these the younger guys, yep. the young Turks or whatever, in 94, 95, 96. And they were behind him. They had, they had He did have 100% support from them right off the bat. It was by 96, 97 when things started to fray, when a lot of the a lot of that talk and that boasting turned out to just be talk and boasting. Yeah. And then there was the situation with the girl. That uh, was Ruthie. terrible. Ruthie, that was Which, a bad move. Again, another issue I had with Ralph when I was trying to put together his book before I left the project and then turned it over to Larry McShane. And I think Larry did a great job uh, taking to the finish line for what it was. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he didn't want it. First of all, he doesn't mention Ruthie in that book. And that was another issue I had. I said, we can't tell the story without mentioning Ruthie. And again, part of this is you taking ownership. Of what you did. For, for, for what you did. Yeah. And I don't think part of it shouldn't have been an issue. You know, he could have said, hey, I was six years old. I just did... 15 years in prison, I was the boss. I felt like that entitled me to a younger girlfriend. I met my daughter's friend, and I took her as my girlfriend, and I probably let, let it go to my head a little bit, and, and it went to her head a little bit, and, it, and it, you know, we, <laughs> he got out of hand. Yeah. But he couldn't admit any of that. And I know that that played a huge role in the erosion of respect uh, and um, just an erosion of... of Civility, really, between yeah. the Merlino guys and and, and uh, Ralph, because Ruthie was a was a girl they grew up with on the street corner. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. that's what they she was. To treat her like she was Princess Di. She was a barroom hump. That's what <laughs> Ruthie right. was. And I know Ruth. And I know Ruthie. Yeah. And, uh, I, again, I, li I like Ruthie. Yeah. So Ruthie's yeah. a, she's a Spitfire. Yeah. And she's a you know she's a little. Um, you know, she could be a little unhinged at times. Just in my a little. Her, Listen, I've that, heard a lot of stories about years. her, Scott. I've heard so a I lot of stories. When she actually had some juice. Yeah. Um, and uh, what she was like, and yeah, and that was that situation got totally out of hand, and uh, she was, you know, she was telling him what to do in public. Yeah, she was. And that that yeah. ain't work. That don't work in that world. No, it and don't. I know there right? was there was one situation at the saloon uh, which is a, a popular hangout i've been uh, there yeah south philly yeah. i want to say it was uh, fall of 97 maybe early 98 it was in the last like six months that ralph was free and she slugged him in public slapped him oh i believe it and and yeah. then there was i think that was the, that was the official end of any respect or, yeah. or any um, deference being to, to Ralph. Because I know a couple guys were, were in a booth that night and they said the only way that Ralph can redeem himself here is if he go home and kills her. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> unless she's, unless she's, dis unless she's <laughs> disappeared this week, yeah. we're done with him. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'm, gonna tell, I'm not going to say who. I, you know, I had several meetings down there and uh, my close friend down there, I'm not going to say no names. 
But they wanted to clip both of them several times. Ralph's mm -hmm. lucky he got picked up because he wouldn't have lasted. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have lasted. And when I started hearing the stories and what was going on, uh, you know, I couldn't blame them. I couldn't blame them. And when you take a girl like that, being the boss of the family. You we know, had a similar story yeah, up here. You know, a barroom <laughs> hump like that, and you take her in. And I'm not saying Ruthie's a bad person. Yeah. I never, I, well, I seen her in clubs. We used yeah. to, she didn't come near us, but we used to see her out. <laughs> You know, uh, I never talked to her. She's on Facebook. I mean, I, she contacted me on Facebook. Like, yeah. So, I mean, it wasn't hard for me to track her down. Yeah. You know, so, uh, and, and then I heard that uh, the whole time Ralph was in prison, he stood in touch with her. Yeah, well, well, she told me that, too. Yeah, but um, she denied it in the public. I don't know about the, I don't know yeah. the whole time, but I've heard yeah. that from other people as well. Yeah. I know that when he came out in 13, I think, or 14, he reached out to her and tried to, I don't know, oh, allegedly romance men them. Yeah, yeah. Or have, have some type of meet up or. Yeah. I don't know. It, well, it, Ralph's wife, I'll tell you, Ralph's wife, uh, Lucia, I mean, that's a, that's a true blue woman there. Oh yeah. She's been with him for, she's still with him, I don't know, 65 years or whatever. It's, uh, that's loyalty. Yeah. 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 That is, that's loyalty. We want to we want to sag into what we're going to talk about. Um, I got to, I was lucky enough to, uh, get to know, uh, Joe Profaci's daughter, uh, Rosalie, mm -hmm. uh, who's still alive and she's like my Nona, yeah. um, one of the most amazing women I ever met. And I got to meet her because I spent the last couple, uh, let's say the last year or the last handful of months of of uh tony zarelli's life with him and mm -hmm. he was the uh underboss of the detroit uh, mob from the, the 70s into the 2000s at one point he was an acting boss um was one of the more powerful mafia figures in america at one point and when i was meeting with him he had gone from all the way to the top of the mountain to the lowest valley and yeah. he had been demoted to a soldier and, uh, yeah. he was put on the shelf Yep. And he had been shunned, uh, and he was a broken man, uh, mentally, physically, emotionally. And the only thing that really kept him going was Rosalie. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to meet Rosalie via Tony. And again, Rosalie was, if you saw the movie The Godfather, you know, Rosie was Connie Corleone. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> Rosalie grew up. Uh, as you know, the quintessential mafia princess. Yeah. Uh, there was nobody more powerful in the New York Five families in the '40s and '50s than, than Joe Profaci, yeah. the olive oil king, oh, yeah. um, who they based a lot of the Vito Corleone character on. Mm -hmm. And and the fact, you know, so and another thing, if people don't. I'm sure. I'm, I'm guessing your audience probably doesn't know that uh, the the Joe Profaci married his two daughters to. The Godfathers of Detroit sons. What? So the founding fathers of the Detroit Mafia were uh, Joe Zerilli and Black Bill Toko. They were brother-in-laws, first cousins, best friends, and uh, they created what is the modern-day Detroit La Cosa Nostra. They won a what was known as the Crosstown War uh, in 1930. Took control of the city and then brought everyone underneath one banner kind of in coordination with what Luciano was doing at that exact same time in, in New York. York. Yep. Um, and they were both on the commission. And, and, in, and then in 1949, and then again in 1951, uh, Joe Profaci married uh, Rosalie Profaci off to uh, Joe's early son, Tony. Mm -hmm. And then uh, his other daughter, Carmela, who they call Millie, uh, was married to Black Bill Toko's son, Tony Toko. Wow. And both daughters are still alive. And uh, they didn't, they weren't speaking for uh, uh, about 10 years because of what was going on in the Detroit mob politics. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the olive oil king was, was turning over in his grave that his two 80 year old, you know, they were in their 80s, two, wow. uh, his two daughters in their 80s weren't talking because their husbands were in a a, a war, not a war where they were shooting each yeah. other, but in a, a war of words or, or whatnot. But since 
both of their husbands passed away, they reconciled, and now they're both 87, 88 years old. Oh, God bless them. God bless them. I'll follow you. Live and live, you know, uh, see each other every day. And, and, but, but, the, but what I'm saying is, is Rosalie Profaci was the most loyal wife, most true blue partner to Tony Z. And believe me, Tony Z was not an angel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she, I, just to see her take care of him at the end and see what type of woman she was, that's that's true blue. Yeah, that's yeah. true blue. Yeah. yeah, some of them are amazing. Joe Rosky yeah. would be yeah. would be so proud of what Rosalie uh, yeah. has. I mean, what a, I'm just I'm I've never I've met very few women in my life. They're not out there and, no uh, more like that. No. You don't no, find women like, like that. Profashi. And this woman, this is a woman that met me when I was thirty nine, maybe thirty eight. Uh, this woman sends me, and I'm bur- I mean, people that are looking at my name Bernstein, they can figure I'm not. Italian, yeah. I'm Jewish, uh, and this woman sends me a, a Christmas Hanukkah card every, I haven't, you know, Tony Z died in 2015, mm-hmm. so I haven't had any business with them in six years, every December, you know, 15th, every year I get a card from Rosalie, a phone call from Rosalie, let's go out to lunch, let's go have cappuccino, oh, what a woman, what <laughs> yeah, a woman. Yeah, that's nice, huh? God bless. I'll tell and you. She should, last thing I'll tell you is she showed yeah. me a uh, family photo uh, album of hers. And just for a little uh, mafia history, Joe Provacci went to war in the 60s against Crazy Joe Gallo. And yeah. Brothers, oh, yeah. And it was a yeah. huge uh, you know, Wild West in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, she showed me a picture from Christmas 1955 where Joe Gallo is at Christmas dinner at Joe Probacci's house. Wow. Imagine that. <laughs> See? Well, at one time, you know, yeah. everybody was together. And they lived, and they, and Probacci bought Franklin uh, FDR's uh, uh, estate from him. <laughs> so that's where Rosalie uh, grew up, was at the, the well, I guess, Probacci had a lot of properties, but yeah. he had yeah. a huge estate in New Jersey that was uh, FDR's. Imagine that. And that's yeah. where uh, yeah. Rosie grew up. You know? Imagine that. Like a governor, so, governor's estate. Yeah. It has to be. Yeah. It's all you know, yeah. <laughs> how many of our, our viewers, they're so enthralled in this Detroit. I mean, you're talking about yeah. Detroit. You're talking about Hoffa. You're talking about all yeah. these different things. So I was so happy to get you on the show, Scott, because we're going to pull all this out of you today. <laughs> there, there, are, there are three things that are synonymous with Detroit that everybody knows synonymous with Detroit. Yeah. But... What people don't know, other than Hoffa, also synonymous with the Mafia. Yeah. Hoffa, the Ford Motor Company, and Motown. Yeah, yeah. both Hoffa. Yeah, Detroit. And yeah. So everyone knows Hoffa was connected to the mob, but not everyone knows that the Ford Motor Company and Motown were both you know, up to their noses in, in uh, Mafia affiliations. Yes. Imagine that, Ford. <laughs> well, they Every control Ford the audience, was, everything, yeah. yeah. That, was one of my, that was actually one of my biggest surprises in my early research. Um, was how oh, deeply involved Henry Ford was with the. It became known as the Tokos early crime family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but how he, uh, you know, used those guys uh, to break strikes mm-hmm. um, and keep everyone in line. But then he would also, all of the, you know, those, those plants, those motor uh, uh, manufacturing plants mm-hmm. were. In Detroit, we have so many of them. So I, I, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm just so used to them being around me. I'm not, I don't, I can't picture living in a city that every couple <laughs> miles you don't see a huge auto factory. Yeah. But I can get, I know that in Detroit, you know, it's very specific to, to the, the auto economy here in Detroit. But these 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 plants are like, they're cities. Yeah, really. Oh, yeah. They're like yeah. cities within cities. And Ford, dating all the way back to the 20s, would give all of the contracts in the plants, the vending contracts, the cleaning contracts, <laughs> all it would all go all to Toko's early cry family members. Yeah. 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 And then in return, uh, almost every Detroit mob figure from, let's say, the 30s into the 60s or 70s had a Ford dealership. Yeah, yeah. And he, he, he give them Ford Motor yeah. uh, dealerships. That was a good And there part. was a guy. There was a guy that they called the Tony Cars. His real name was Anthony Dana, 
And Anthony Dana was the liaison, the conduit to all the motor companies. And it was like, you needed a, uh, you're, you're, you're a mafia capo or you're a mafia administrator and your son's graduating from college. You need to give him a job. Go see Tony Dan. Go see Tony <laughs> Cars. He's going to hook you up with a Ford dealership. Wow. That's great. That's uh, great. I'll tell this. you, that's something. The Detroit mob was big. And, you know, yeah. we've talked about it, about the winter, Boston went the hill connection with Detroit. Yeah, so I was, te- yeah, I was telling Bob, uh, it's a, kind of a, another little known piece of mob history, and it's, and it's something that really could have changed the entire evolution of the whole Whitey Bulger, Stevie Flemmy story could have really not even existed if, they would have gone down in this Winter Hill bust that happened in Detroit. But um, the prosecutors in Detroit, uh, guys that I, or my sources that I've spoken, that I yeah. speak to in an interview, uh, told me that they were instructed um, that they could not put Bulger and Fleming <laughs> into the indictment. Imagine Even though Bulger and Fleming uh, were puppeteering everything that was going on in Detroit. So let me just backtrack for a second. 1976, um, the Winter Hill Gang has a branch of the Winter Hill Gang that just does horse race fixing, um, dog race fixing. High life. High life, uh, sports gambling, point spread manipulation. And, And there was a guy named Anthony... Tony the Fixer or Fat Tony Chula Chula, uh, spelled his name C I U L L A. Yeah. From uh, I believe Medford. Yeah, Chula. Um, yeah. And uh, has been dubbed uh, by uh, the federal government at that time. Let's say from 1960 to 1975, he was known as the number one horse race fixer in in America. Sports Illustrated did a huge cover story on him. Wow. Um, discussing all this and uh, he was in charge of this unit and he had a whole crew of Winter, Winter Hill guys that they would go, mostly it would be in the Northeast. They were doing a lot of this at Suffolk Downs Yeah, yeah and, Suffolk uh, Downs was big, yep uh, Other, New York, Massachusetts Connecticut. I'm not exactly sure what brought and then they were doing stuff down in Miami and in California I'm not sure what brought them to Detroit. I'm, I haven't actually been able to trace what brought them here. Well, from history, it'd have to be a mob connection. Because well, so the, right, that, well, the mob connection is... That family that would the, have to okay right, this. So the founding, yeah. Right, so the founding fathers of the Detroit mob, who I, who I referenced, uh, uh, Black Bill Toko and, Toko. and yeah. uh, Joe, Joe Zerilli, when their sons, who were the second generation of leaders, yeah, uh, when their sons graduated college in 19... 19- 49, they graduated with business degrees from the wow. University of Detroit. Wow. They were given as a graduation present the brand new Hazel Park racetrack, which they would grow over the next decade into one of the, if not the premier, you know, non um, Kentucky Derby, Belmont Stakes, you know, not not those type of horses, but the. I'm not actually complete. I'm not someone who knows the horse world very well. Yeah, no, I, I understand that, what you're that, saying, though. They'll understand. And Hazel what Park you're Racetrack, with, well, Hazel Park Racetrack, not just in Detroit, but in America, was viewed as kind of the gold standard mm-hmm. of, uh, of of horse racing and horse breeding. And uh, they gave as a present to their son, so uh, Black Jack Topo, the son of Black Bill, mm-hmm. and Tony Z Zarelli, the son of Joe Uno Zarelli. Uh, became president and vice president of uh, Hazel Park Racetrack. Hazel Park is um, the first city that you hit when you leave Detroit. So if you're going, uh, Detroit start the uh, downtown Detroit starts where the river is, where uh, Canada, where the Detroit River, where Canada and America meet. And then if you take, if you go on the rip uh, from the riverbed, you're that's south. And then so anytime you're you're going. Outside of uh, downtown, you're going north. Mm-hmm. And if you go all the way north, right to the northern border of Detroit, you hit Hazel Park. And it's, uh, you know, kind of a lower, lower middle, lower middle class working 
factory type environment. Mm -hmm. It wasn't uh, it wasn't a ritzy area at all. Um, really kind of salt of the earth type people. But there's up until a couple years ago when they tore it down, yeah. there was this gleaming racetrack that was like it was a state of the art. Everything about it was state of the art. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so obviously the, the Winter Hill guys knew that Detroit had access to, you know, not just access, but ownership of this big racetrack. So I'm sure that's what attracted, attracted them, oh, attracted sure. them yeah. to Detroit. I just don't know about the specifics about who reached out to who yeah. and how the deal was arranged for them to work with the Detroit family in, in fixing these races. It, it would have had to go through Raymond to go yeah. to the Detroit family. That, and Raymond that, and... Uh, Raymond and, and Joe Zerilli yeah. were, uh, were, were close. Or yeah, for, that, for, for that would have to... Both sat on the commission. And... Yeah. There's no way uh, that anybody could go because Whitey, the Went the Hill gang, you remember the Monterano brothers, they were Petriaca and Julio. They wouldn't have ever made a move like that outside without them. To go to one of the crime family, you would have to go through Raymond. Yeah. Or Jerry and Julio. So there's probably some things that are reached out to, reach out to uh, Joe Uno. And at that point, Joe Uno was in his uh, final days. Yeah. Joe Zerilli uh, ran the Detroit family from 1936 to 1977, 41 oh, years as the godfather, never did a day in prison. Uh, Black Bill Toko was actually the first boss from 31 to 36 and then went to prison on a tax, uh, tax evasion charge came out and didn't want the uh, mantle back. He just wanted to kind of be in an advisory capacity. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so so uh, Joe's, this would have been 75, 76. Joe's really would have been, you know, not of the best health. He died in the end, he died at the end of 77. But Jack Toko, who was his nephew um, and his the heir apparent, uh, and then Tony's really, who was his son, they were in charge of this, this racetrack. This venue, yeah. so um, I'm sure as we're talking about it that, that there was some type of uh, meeting of the minds between Raymond and, and Joe Uno, which allowed uh, the Winter Hill guys to come into town. And yeah. it wasn't like they came into town for a day or two here. They like embedded for like five months, where yeah. they uh, rented a. I think a, a apartment complex of some sort. They set up shop at this bar called uh, Derby's. Um, Roach was right across, it's still there actually, right across the street from the racetrack. Um, and then they were being surveilled, uh, not just at Derby's and not just at the racetrack, but then running back and forth from the, the different Detroit Mob Capos headquarters. Mm -hmm. So they would leave the racetrack and they'd go to, you know, Midtown Detroit where the Corrado brothers crew was. They'd come back and then maybe a couple of days later they'd head to the South Flat Athletic Club where the Jackalones were. Yeah. So they were in communication with all these different crews. Mm -hmm. And I wish I wish I had these photos. I told Bob when I first told him about the story that I have uh, I have a bunch of these photos. But they're in, I've just, I moved recently and they're in my storage locker. I didn't have time to go grab them. Yeah. But I actually have photos from 76 uh, of Whitey and Stevie. And there was a guy named uh, Fat Jerry Friedman. Oscar, his name is Oscar Friedman. They called him Fat Jerry. There was a guy named Patty, uh, uh, Pat, they called him Patty Mac. He was Italian. Pat Ma Macarani, Pat, uh, Pasquale Macarano. Um... There was uh, uh, a, one of the uh, Sim, Sims, Jimmy Sims. No, that don't sound like that. No, no. I was wondering the Paddywhack one was that the guy made it on the bar named Paddywhacks down near the Willow where we used to hang up and went to hell. It could have there been. There was the bar over there with the same name, but he said the name, it just reminded me. Of these yeah, because you can remember that gang was located yes. in yeah. Somerville. Went the hell was in Somerville. Yeah. And it was the Somerville, uh, South Boston guys. The South Boston guys consisted of Johnny Monterano, Jimmy Monterano, Whitey Stevie, Frank Salemi, that whole crew. And really that whole crew in South Boston, Larry Zanino, uh, Larry Bioni was a yeah, right. big was the, cop was on that. He was yeah. the overseer on that. And uh, Howie Winters, yep. who's 
uh, I, I'll tell you on this show, real gangsters, you know, man's man. But everybody thought they named the gay, uh, the gang after him. After <laughs> after <laughs> after <laughs> yeah, but it, it was really I, so I with the hill. <laughs> yeah, everybody thinks that, you know, and, and uh, I guess how we so really. You know, uh, until you understand the landscape of uh, yeah, right. uh, Boston. Yeah, and how we really played on that, like yeah. he was the boss of the crew. <laughs> But up there, he was a boss. But, I mean, he oh, yeah. was a bad guy. How we want this? He passed away. Oh, now. by the way, he he went down in this case. I see. There you go. Yeah. The case I'm talking about, he went down. On. Oh, I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure. Uh, I don't have any. I didn't have any surveillance photos of him in Detroit, but I know that he was involved in the in the indictment. The indictment came down in '78 or '79, but Chula flipped. So Chula was the head of the crew. He was the one that was telling them how to. Do everything, yeah, yeah setting it up. Race fixing. Yeah. Um, so Chula is flipped here in Detroit by a uh, uh, an agent named Oscar Feldman. Um, and Feldman uses that bus to propel, you know, just like in any profession, in the mob too, you know, you do something that, that uh, is valuable, you can use that as a propeller of yeah. the chain. Yeah, So, absolutely. you know, Oscar Feldman, uh, yeah. I believe, used that, bust of, of Winter Hill to then become the ASAC where mm -hmm. he became the, the person in charge of of the of the whole office. Yeah. So it was a it was a big headline grabbing bust. Uh so they flipped Shula. Shula wanted if I interviewed Bellman, I interviewed a number of the other agents that, that worked the case. Bellman was giving them Stevie and, and Whitey up uh, on a on a silver platter. Yeah, but they and were already with the Justice Department. <laughs> <laughs> Robert E. And they're being and they're being told you can't include them in the bus. Yeah. Well, you know, then really their their core well, they were terrorizing people back from the sixties, but oh, yeah. when they were doing most of their terrorizing with help from the government was in the eighties. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Where where he was climbing the ladder, uh and uh you know, killing people and and feeding bus to the to the government to get rid of his yeah. Uh, well, rivals and all—all all that could have been, all that could have never happened if they had been in prison with Howie do. Winter in this in this uh, bus, which happened in, in, in the Hazel Park racetrack in Detroit. You wouldn't think that that that's what brought down a, a big chunk of the Winter Hill game. Yeah. Now they went to Howie Winter several times while he was in prison because they knew what Whitey Stevie did to him, and he was a man's man. He wouldn't talk. Yeah. Howie would not talk. Come that's on, right, old well, man. But that's what. That's what sent Salemi over to them. Yeah. Was when he was just sitting in uh, his cell going over uh, discovery documents and realizing yeah. that uh, his own guys were giving him up. Oh, yeah. Been there, done that. We know, yeah. we know that feeling. We know that feeling. <laughs> and, uh, well, because we were running to a Jackie Salemi, yeah. his brother. He made him he's a still copper. alive, right? I have no Jackie's idea. Jackie's still alive. Jackie's still alive. And I always wonder why Jackie was able to stay, uh, kind of stay on uh, Away from the fray with all that. Well, you know, you can't really. Uh, I don't know. Where, you know. It's like hunting. No, a, no. It's like hunting a three-legged deer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jackie <laughs> was in the middle of everything we were doing, and Jackie yeah. never got a scratch. So well, that can and, tell ja you. and Jackie, in the case that Salemi ended up taking, um, the Stevie did, or the most recent case he ended up taking and, and is doing life in prison for over the murder, uh, the yeah. murder of Stevie DeSaro in May of 93. Yeah. Some accounts of that put Jackie there. In the house, yeah. Right, in the house. See, he didn't tell on that murder. Yeah. He didn't. Uh, Frankie Jr. was already dead when Frankie got pinched. Yeah, I know. And he didn't never mention that murder because of his brother Jackie. Yeah. To protect him. This I've is, heard he was a real. I've heard that uh, Frankie Jr. was a real piece of work, man. I've talked to a dozen people that knew him. I haven't heard one positive word about the guy. No, no, he was a wahoo. The kid was a wahoo. I liked him. You know, uh, he ran with, with our other friend, uh, another cop on the Patriarca yeah. family. With the, I hear with the dad. I hear when I met and I've met the dad. Yeah. But other, you know, I hear that like he had a side to him that was incredibly likable yeah. and incredibly. But then he had this other psychotic side. And then yeah, I he heard did. that Frankie yeah. Boy didn't have any of the likeability. Yeah, no, no. Just no, had no. the psychotic side. Yeah. Uh, it was funny, too. I've been to Cafe Victoria on Hanover Street one day. And to me, like, I didn't bother, you know. I didn't say hi to him. Mm. He was sitting at two tables <laughs> down. And he walked past me. Yeah, how you doing? And he ran out. this. look at this fucking kid. Yeah. Like, I got to say hi to you. 
you know, at that point. That's when I read the I first not coming back. Yeah, yeah. You know, but uh, I like Frankie Jr. Uh, the few times that I was around him and talked with him. But, yeah, Frankie was a wahoo. Yeah. Yeah.